going to focus on right now really is not aerial rescue. What we're focusing on is the assessment portion of aerial rescue. So for a long time, and Chad, you're a competitive climber like me. I am. For a long time in competition climbing, <laughs> what we found was how fast we can get up a tree and how fast we can yard somebody out of a tree. Let's just jerk them out of the tree as fast as we can. And what we really found in that is what we were teaching was really good aerial recoveries, right? Because rescue, in order to be a rescue, we have to do assessments, right? And for a long time, we've preached that, oh, the fire department can't come get you. Well, I take offense to that. I was 15 years full-time fire uh, rescue and... Sorry to hear that. Oh, I was a beautiful career. I loved it. And then take, take offense to the fact that you say, I can't come get you, right? We can come get you, all right? Now, Dr. Ball did a study a while back, and he did write an article, and in that article it said it could take up to three hours for fire and rescue to come get you. That doesn't mean it's going to take three hours. It could take up to three hours. Take L.A. County, for instance. L.A. County probably does about three palm rescues a week right now, right? They're probably really good at palm rescues, right? Maybe here in Indianapolis, I don't know. Maybe they'd be fast. Maybe they wouldn't. I don't know. Best way to do is find out and get with your local department. So what we're talking about really is not the rescue portion. We know we're really good at getting in trees and we're really good at getting things out of trees. We have no issue in lowering things to the ground. But what we need to look at is the actual assessments. There are three times you need to get somebody to the ground. Cardiac arrest, you cannot do chest compressions on Chad if his back is not against something. It doesn't work. His back's just gonna move, right? And I don't care what size tree you're in, there's not a branch out there big enough for me to lay Chad on and do compressions on him. It's not gonna work. It's no right? fun. No, it's no fun. A hemorrhage or control you cannot bleed. Or you cannot control, sorry, a bleed you can't, yeah. A hemorrhage or bleed you cannot control is what I meant to say. That's why I wear the red shirt, so you can't tell I'm bleeding or not. You or it's like Star today. Trek, All right, you know, like that. Yeah, so. <laughs> we talked about chainsaw protection earlier. So now I've cut my femoral artery, right? I've got a bleed. That's a bleed I can't control. So I need a tourniquet that. I'm going to need to get to the ground as fast as possible. I have three and a half minutes before I bleed out. So that's another situation. We need to get to the ground. The last situation we want to take somebody to the ground versus staying in the tree is going to be a situation that environment presents that is worse for my person to stay aloft than on the ground. So dead of winter, hypothermia, thunderstorm season. Maybe you're out in Oklahoma and it's tornado season, right? You got a, a storm coming in. That's not going to be good for Chad in the tree, right? To leave him no. there for a tornado. Love the movie Twister, not good for Chad. So those are the only three times we want to get people to the ground. Everything else is called stay and play, meaning I'm going to get access to Chad before fire rescue gets there, and I'm going to do an assessment. And that's what we're going to talk about is the assessment, right? This assessment I'm going to teach you right now is called a rapid trauma assessment. But here's the best part is you don't need to be a nurse, a doctor, a surgeon, a paramedic, or an EMT. What you're going to do doesn't matter, really. What you're doing is you're playing Sherlock Holmes. You're going to be doing all of this to find out what's going on, to report back to fire rescue when they arrive. So it's what you see, what you hear, and what you smell, right? You're an investigator. So yeah, I can feel Chad's pulse, and I can tell his pulse is running. Wow, you're in really good shape. It's running about 52 beats Thank a minute you. right now. Well, he's a good looking guy, he works out, so it's 52 beats a minute. Now, if he just did an ascent, and I got up there, and I check it, and it's 52 beats a minute, that's gonna tell me something else is going on. But I have an extensive medical background for that. Guess what, we don't need to know that. So I'm not even gonna teach you pulses because most likely you're gonna check it wrong anyway, and you're gonna be like, wow, your pulse is really fast. No, that's your pulse because you're stressed, oh. not Chad's pulse. So how we're gonna do this, it's a head to toe rapid trauma assessment, all right? What we're gonna start with, we start with the head. What I'm looking for here is I'm looking at his glasses. If he doesn't have clear glasses on, we're gonna lift them out of the way. So if I had my shield dropped, I would lift my shield up. I'm checking his eyes. What I'm looking for there is just anything that doesn't look normal, right? So eyes, good. Next, I'm gonna check his mouth. I'm not putting my fingers in people's mouths. That's how you lose your fingers, right? And what I'm looking for here is any missing teeth, any bleeding like that. If he's got a lot of blood in his mouth and he's missing teeth, those teeth are somewhere, all right? They may be on the ground or they might be in his belly. That's things that I might need to tell first responders when they arrive. From here, I'm coming down his neck and I'm checking here. My thumbs are going on the clavicle here and I'm pressing in, I'm checking his shoulders. I'm also gonna keep my hands together and down the arms at the same time. Reason being is if I check this arm and then come this arm, I can't tell if there's difference. Right? Maybe Chad just got a really big right bicep and not a big left bicep. That might be normal for Chad. We won't talk about why, but it might be normal. But what we really want to do, thank you, is I want to check symmetry. They should, the human body is symmetrical. We should be seeing the same sizes as I go down. If I feel a big mass over here, I need to tell somebody that. Once I finish down here, I'm going to have him grab my hands. And I'm going to say, squeeze. He should squeeze my hands with the same amount of pressure on both sides. If one squeeze harder than the other, Something's wrong, right? From there, I'm coming to the chest. I'm gonna put my hands like a W, and Chad's gonna turn for me here. 
There you go. And when he takes a breath, watch my hands. They slide out. What that tells me as a, as a medical professional is that you have equal chest rise and fall. You don't have a collapsed lung situation. You don't have a neothorax, anything like that. That's normal. If I do this and only one side moves, that's a problem, right? Maybe he took a big old dinger in the chest and he's got a flail chest segment and that's moving independently. You don't need to know what that means. You just need to know, hey, this is doing this and it's not supposed to. From here, I come to my stomach. Stomach, again, I'm using my thumbs, hands on the side, I'm pushing at the top and pushing at the bottom. Wow, those are really hard. All right, that's impressive, right? Here, I'm rather squishy and that's okay, right? But what I'm feeling for is hard masses. If I feel this side and this side's squishy and this side's a hard mass, for a medical professional, that means you have internal bleeding, right? That's something going on there. But again, we don't need to know that. We just need to know, hey, he's got something here. Now, if he's got something here that has kicking and like a pulse, you might wanna ask him if he's pregnant, right? That might be a logical question. If we just have a pulse, I need to let somebody know that. You should have no pulses in your stomach. That's not normal, all right? From here, I'm putting my hands on his hips, and what I'm doing is I'm pushing in and doing this side to side, right? What I'm feeling for here is independent movement, any type of pelvic fracture that's occurred. You can bleed out from a pelvic fracture, so it's real quick, in, run, and then I'm coming down the legs, doing the same thing I did on his hands, all the way down, and I'm done. What did I not check? Anything here, okay? Reason being is, you're not trained medical professional. There is spiny prominence on the entire spinal cord. If he has a spinal issue and you push in on these wrong places, you could paralyze somebody, right? So we're gonna stay away from the back. You know, no, don't need to know anything there except, hey, yep, it's there, right? If it's a big blood pool, he's got blood. If it's something sticking out, there's something sticking out. Other than that, we're not checking it. That is a rapid trauma assessment and that's what it should look like, all right? Now, that took me a long time to talk through it, all right? I don't expect you when you hear that woo, 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 coming from a distance, you're like, okay, this should take me about 10 minutes to do this. This should take you no more than 45 seconds to a minute to complete, all right? So this is what it looks like in real time. Hey, Chad, are you okay? Oh. Oh. Hey, man, can you squeeze my fingers? Awesome, dude, can you take a breath for me? Okay, great. Awesome, thanks. And that's it. It's a rapid trauma assessment. You also can do this aloft. So it, we don't have harnesses on, but if we had harnesses on, he was in a seated position, I can do the exact same things. Are you gonna try to, are you gonna like get in the rope and like Swiss seat it real quick and like. <laughs> but we can do these things. We can do these in the loft. He does not have to be in the erect position to do this. All right, he can be laying down, he can be on his side. Maybe he fell out of a bucket and he's doing the whole puppet man thing, right? I can still do this assessment that way. The matters here is what we tell fire and rescue when they arrive. What we see, what we hear, and what we smell. You're probably wondering to yourself, why smell? Okay, smell's a big deal for us. Things that smell funny, we like to key into. One of the biggest things for us is a thing called Akita acidosis, all right? It's a diabetic condition. So if I'm checking him and I'm standing right here and I smell his breath and his breath smells like Malibu rum or Fruit Loops, that doesn't mean Chad is drunk. Okay, but that's the common conception is, whoo, man, that's a Malibu, whoo. Okay, more than Good that. Good party last night. Yeah, I hear you, all right? It doesn't mean he's drunk. What it could mean is he could have a diabetic condition that's creating gases in his stomach to churn and create a fruity smell, right? I can, as a medical professional, I could correct that very easily if I know about it, right? So if I'm up in the tree and I'm like, hey, this guy smells drunk, but he acts pretty normal. They're gonna be like, hey, they might be a diabetic. Hey, ask him if he's a diabetic. Hey, Chad, you diabetic? Yes. Oh, huh. Well, we know what's going on with Chad now. We know why he couldn't climb anymore today. So those are all things we can look at, right? So what do we see? Well, I see he's not bleeding anywhere. Something's not going on. So if I have no trauma, what does that mean that the problem is? It's a medical problem, right? Do I have a medical condition now I'm dealing with? So the two things we're going to deal with mostly in our industry are trauma-related and medical-related emergencies, right? What can we do for trauma? Stop the bleed. Call help, that's it. So if he's got something stuck in him, we're not pulling things out, all right? If he took a bullet shot, because he works in California and people shoot people. Of course. All right, we're not plugging wounds, that's not our job. It's gonna be like, hey, he got shot, it's bleeding a lot, um, I'm holding pressure, but I don't know what else to do. Great, all right? And then also, what do we hear? Hearing is crucial, 
right? Turn chippers off, turn trucks off. I want to hear what's going on with Chad, all right? So if he's wheezing when I'm talking to him, that's more like Darth Vader. I believe he's wheezing. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> all right, if he's wheezing, I know it's an upper airway constriction. He's got something going on here. If he's got rails or gurgles, it's a lower airway issue, right? Maybe he's got something going on in the lower alveoli sacs in the lungs. He's got fluid in there. We can deal with those things, right? But I need to know what you're hearing because that's going to dictate how we handle the emergency. The other big thing is you have to make access before first responders arrive. So if I'm old Travis riding the fire truck and I pull up and you're on the ground and you're like, hey, I can climb trees. I'm going to go up there and help. We're going to be like, hey, no, you're not. Because uh, I don't know who you are, right? I have no idea about your abilities. And all I'm doing now is potentially making a second victim. But if I get there and Chad's already up in the tree, I'm not going to make Chad come down. He's an asset to me now, right? So it's going to be like, oh, hey, you're up there with him. Great. Why don't you stay and help me? Right? What can I do for you? Exactly. Right? The biggest thing is you want to be a help, not a hindrance here. So how are you a hindrance to fire rescue? Running around like a crazy person. Right? Doesn't help. We used to call them jumpers and wavers. We hope on seeing everybody's doing this. It's over here. It's over here. Yeah, we know. We got the call, it's for a tree care company, there's a chipper in the driveway. We kind of assumed it's you, right? So we don't need jumpers and waivers, right? We need to figure out what's going on. We're gonna be doing a scene assessment. That's gonna take a little bit of time. When we need information, we will ask for information. But if you come up and hound us, all you're gonna do is get three hot and a cotton and a pair of bracelets, right? Because now you're a hindrance to me and we need you to go away, right? And that's what PD's there to do. So be a help, don't be a hindrance. And only one person come up. I don't need to be flooded by 50 people. Does not help the scene, right? Lastly, if you're in a loft, you've made access, just stay and hang out with Chad, right? I don't need to move Chad. I don't want to move Chad. He might have a spinal issue. He might have a medical issue going on. I don't want to go about moving and manipulating him. I want to stay here and take direction for first responders on scene. So Chad, what is your role with A+. I'm in charge of safety and training for A+. Safety and training? Yes. So do they you guys do the rescue training? We do. Really? How often do you do it? Uh, actually, we do it. It depends on which team it is, but it's definitely about every two months we do it. Awesome. And actually, they rescue me. Great. So the so reason you're why, used to this. I am. So the reason why we do that is when you interact with a real person, it's different than interacting with a dummy. And Absolutely. then the other part is, like we talked about the competition, there's a time limit. But when you're doing a rescue, there's actually people get injured or die practicing aerial rescue. So it defeats the purpose of what we're trying to train or what we're trying to learn about. Yeah is actually about how to rescue. It's actually the number one cause of fatality in, in training is doing aerial rescue training. Yes. Um, there was an incident that occurred a few years back at an OSHA safety day where they were demonstrating aerial rescue at a zoo and both rescuer and patient fell. One died, one became paralyzed with OSHA standing there watching them. You can only imagine how that investigation went. Um, not a whole lot to investigate there. It's we watched it happen. Exactly, they did. So aerial rescue training is so important. So when I became a fireman, I went through 28 weeks of academy training. They trained us how to deal with adrenaline. They train us how to deal with stressful situations and how to control emotions and all that. That's why you never see a fireman run unless the donut sign's on, right? If we're running, that's bad, right? You like that one? I like that one. So if you see a fireman running, you probably should run faster than them in the same direction, right? So we calm, cool, and collect is the key. Wait, I thought they'd run towards stuff, not away from stuff. Run in when you're running out? The yes. Shirts? Yeah. So if they're going in, you go out. You go out the direction. Yeah. All right. I'm not sure. So the real what we're talking about here is being calm, cool, and collected. So how do we do that? In through the nose out through the mouth. We want to calm things down. This is somebody you've worked with every single day who's now having a traumatic incident, right? I've known Chad for a number of years. Even though I don't work with Chad, we work in different companies. If I was on a, seat of a job site with him and something bad happened, I'm going to be emotional about it, all right? Even with all of my training, hopefully the old fireman kicks in and it takes over, but I'm going to be emotional. You are going to be emotional. It's okay. We expect you to be emotional about it. We expect you to be excited and anxious. It's okay. In with the nose, out with the mouth, Calm, cool, and collect is the key here, right? Now, everything's bad happened. We got Chad out of the tree. Things are getting better. Great, wonderful. Now what happens? Chad, what happens once we get out of the tree? Well, hopefully the EMTs are there to assist. Hopefully. Hopefully they're already there early because someone actually dialed 911 Correct. Early before anyone left the ground. Correct. Dialing 911 but actually, is crucial. I want to just, just go one step back. Please. If someone on your team doesn't like seeing blood and they pass out because they see blood, know who that person is because that person you want to send to the street to meet the EMTs. To be the jumper and waiver? Yes, because you don't want to have them help out the victim because now say you have two victims instead of one victim. Great point. And then actually you'll go one more step you back. Don't become the first victim. Don't get yourself hurt or injured. That's the first thing. The best rescue is the one you never have. Exactly. Absolutely. So, so identify the risk and hazards, assess your trees, 
way ahead. There's tons of conversations happening about that. Oh, tons. So dialing 911. First question they're going to ask you, location of your emergency. All right? Now, when the new time, it's called electric 911 or GPS 911, they know where you're calling from. Okay? It's, the cell towers are triangulated. They know within about a five foot radius of where your cell phone's at, where your line line's at. They're not asking for that reason. They're asking to make sure you actually are competent to know what you're talking about. Because 911 gets a lot of crazy calls like, hey, my pizza didn't get delivered. Can you send the police? This is not a lie, this happens. Or, hey, can you send the fire department? My pool needs to be filled up, right? So that's the first question they're gonna ask you is, what's the location of your emergency? All right, the next question is, what is your emergency? This is a crucial, crucial question. For all the big, burly tree guys out there, this is not the time to be a stoic, all right? It's not the time to be like, well, you know, we, we had a little incident. No, uh-uh. This is where we need to give as much information as you can. I want word vomit. Chad Bray was up a tree. He was climbing, he took a big fall and swing. He's about 60 feet up. I don't know, he's screaming and yelling. I've never seen him like, yes, yes, keep it coming. 45 this years old, six, three, oh, sorry. Gorgeous, likes long walks on the beach, small puppies, exactly. fedoras, yes. All, right. All those things are so important because when you call 911, you say, hey, Chad fell. What you're gonna get is you're gonna get a primary ambulance and a primary engine. Primary engine company in a city like Indianapolis is gonna have a captain, a driver, and two individuals on the back of the truck. Your ambulance is gonna have two paramedics. So that's all you're gonna get in that compilation, right? Standard response time in an urban environment is about five and a half to six and a half minutes from the time you call 911. So by the time you call 911, they have 45 seconds to dispatch the call. Fire department has 30 seconds to get on the truck and out of the side of the station, all right? So then the rest of the time is getting there. And we all know driving and traffic, right? And the fire truck comes up, everybody tries to beat people to the lights and all that, and not pull to the right like you're supposed to, all right? So then they finally get there, right? And then they go, oh, you said he fell. Well, yeah, he fell 50 feet up. Oh, I need to call for additional resources. Then you're gonna have the captain go, uh, squad 52, uh, central, I need a technical rescue response. High angle. That's the key word there. They need to know that you have a situation aloft. We need high angle rescue. We need technical rescue. They might dispatch you a ladder truck. They might call for a neighboring department. So I've never been involved in an actual rescue, but I have involved in a recovery when I was working as a fireman. We had a neighboring department that got dispatched out for a rescue. We had a worker on top of a spar, saw a kickback and caused an evisceration across the stomach. And he was a competent, talking individual at the top of the street, and they tried every which way possible to get a ladder truck in this backyard. They tried driving through neighbor's yards, fences, reaching over the house, could not reach this individual. Two and a half hours later, they made a call for additional resources. They called us. We were the local regional response team. We got in. I grabbed my gear off the truck to take it with me, because I'm like, well, I'm a tree guy. I'll take my gear with me, and I'll you know, be that guy. We got there. By the time we got there, three and a half hours on, individual was dead, all right? Because they didn't start the call early. We sit, the firemen sit at the fire station all day long doing two things, eating and waiting for calls. We love running calls and oil for photos, like calendars and this kind of things, but that's like only one month a year, all right? We love running calls, so get us called. We can always turn them around. So ask for more resources, not less resources. We'd rather send the entire city to your emergency and then halfway there, they go, oh, we don't need you. Turn around. Totally cool. So we call 911. We know where we're at. We know what's going on. Then we stay on the phone. We do not hang up. They hang up first, all right? We never hang up first. Everybody has a kid or has been a kid and dial 911 and hang up. What happens? They call you back, right? So we don't want that problem. We stay on the line there, all right? So that's the big things about aerial rescue that you need to understand. It's not about making access. It's not about jerking people out of a tree, but it's about practice, practice, practice. This needs to become muscle memory for us. I love the fact that you guys do it so often. I think that's phenomenal. What have you guys learned in doing it that often that you really find is beneficial for your folks? It's really just learning that protocol you're talking about. So we also fill out a JSA, which is a job safety analysis. So that actually has the address of the works that you're on. So that's in the cab of the truck. So now all of a sudden you have a whole entire team, you cover the address, but also you have the address in the vehicle. So now the person who dials 911 also has that. So it's really that protocol and following that protocol. And when you do more and more, it's the same thing when you compete and do aerial rescues, it becomes second nature. It's literally when you go rescue someone, like, oh cool, I'm gonna assess the person. Just by someone looking in his eyes, I can see he's conscious. I know he's breathing, I know he has a pulse, just from assessing by looking or having a conversation with a person. So there's simple things like that that makes a huge difference yeah. in assessing the situation. I'm so glad you talked on JSAs. So a lot of people in their JSAs actually talk about emergency response. If we have an emergency, what do we do? 
And who does it? And who does it? Because in your brain, believe it or not, you have this thing called lizard brain, all right? And lizard brain is what occurs when anything stressful in life happens. It's fight or flight, right? We're back in our cavemen days, right? The big saber-toothed tiger is outside. You have one choice. You either run inside the cave or you fight him. That's your two choices. The same thing happens now, right? Don't believe me. Get into an argument with somebody. You will feel yourself getting tense. Your skin will start feeling very touchy on the surface, right? Your eyes are going to get really tight. You're going to laser focus in. That's fight or flight. That's also lizard brain. Your brain has one function and one function only in this moment, and it's called survival, right? The way we solve that is by giving your brain something to go back to. So if I've told Chad, hey, today, if we have an emergency, you're calling 911. When cool. his brain goes lizard, he knows, his brain goes, wait, I was supposed to do something right now. What is it I'm supposed to do? Oh. Call 911. 911. Boom. It programs the brain because the brain is kind of like a filing cabinet, right? A lot of people say, oh, I multitask. No, you don't. You throw a ball up in the air and you hope to throw another ball up before that one drops. It's not multitasking, right? So your brain's a filing cabinet. So when we give it files in that filing cabinet, when it goes lizard brain, it opens the drawer and goes, emergency. Ooh, 911. And it works. I know it works because I was on a job site on July 1st of 2019. We had a climber fall out of a tree about 60 feet. We did a really good JSA before the day started. Everybody had assignments. Ironically enough, the climber didn't get an assignment, which I think might have been what caused the issue. Just, just hindsight here, but- 2020. It was a little bit, right? So we're on this job. He falls 60 feet, bounces off saw, crushes his saw, right? Crane operator, emergency, three horn whistle, right? So I come running over there. Hey, I'm on the Cinnas. Hey guys, we got an emergency. Instantly, this guy called 911. This guy shut the trucks off. I did first aid. This guy over here moved all the equipment. It was seamless. Fire rescue showed up. They ever said that. They integrated with us. It wasn't, we're taking over us. What can we do to help? What do you need? And it was a perfect example of when we have pre-plans and we go into place, it goes flawlessly. Later on, they came back to us. We met up with them later for a debrief on it. And they say to that, they said it's probably the best rescue they've ever dealt with because of we solved the lizard brain problem before it became a problem, right? Had we not done that, it'd just been chaos. But people running around everywhere, right? And that doesn't work, right? So we gotta make sure we do good JSAs. I'm so glad you brought that up. My pleasure. We got a few minutes left. Is there anything else you wanna add? Something else I wanna add is that People, when they have an accident or an injury, they're not like, oh, hey, just, just want to let you know, you know, at 2.30, I'm going to get an accident, and then oh, you can come get I gotta, me. I got to go. Yeah, go. I know. We're a little <laughs> behind. But really what it is is that when you're on the team, and actually share this with your team members, is to just do an assessment. Just constantly look around. Have your head on a swivel, and make sure that, you know, if you have John in the tree or you have someone else working the chipper, you know that there's action or motion going on every five minutes. It does not take long to assess someone. I'm actually assessing all of you right now as I'm speaking that you're alive, you're awake, and you're paying attention. So the same thing can happen on your team and your crew because you never know when something's gonna go wrong. You don't know if they're gonna be diabetic, they might pass out. Because they pass out, they're like, oh hey, I'm, you know, it's- You asleep? No. Narcolepsy tree guy? Exactly. I'll send that YouTube video. There you go. Yes, him. <laughs> so the thing is that pay attention to your whole entire team members Absolutely. and it takes a, a split second to be able to assess and you just get back to what you need to do. And you assess every day. You know when your team is on their game or when they're not, right? So one of my favorite questions to ask a crew before they leave the shop in the morning. Hey, is your head in the game? Are you good? Because if your head's not in the game, I need you to take a, I need to take a day off, right? Go get your life in order. Go handle whatever you need to handle. Because in this industry, you only get a chance to make one mistake. That one mistake may be your last mistake, right? We don't get a lot of do-overs in this job. Can you imagine no. if you got do-overs on blowing tops of trees out? You're like, Oh, that one didn't go up. Bring it back up. Let's do, let's do it again. I, I didn't like the way that one went, right? I'm going bigger this time. I go, I, I go six more inches down. I can, I can fit it. I know I can, right? No, we don't, we don't get do-overs, right? The same thing happens in our emergencies. We don't get do-overs. We only get one shot to get this right. And when it's your coworker or one of your good friends, that's one shot to save a life. Ripping people out of trees is not the answer. Good assessments is the answer. Getting, making access when fire rescue gets there is the answer. How to call 911 and what to say how to do a JSA and why we do JSAs or job briefings depending on the language your company uses. And then lastly, practice, practice, practice. This is not something that you've been trained to do unless you've gone through fire rescue training, paramedic training, police, military, something like that. It's not an innate feature to you, right? So you've got to learn it like anything else. You've got to practice it. Chad, thank you so cool. much. Thanks thank so you much. TCIA for doing this. Uh, now we got steel coming in next to do the student career day stuff. So hang around, cheer on the students. They love that support. They are the next generation. If you haven't told, 
Chad and I aren't getting any younger. We're just getting no. older. And eventually we're going to need people to replace us on stages. So please, please, please hang out, support them in what they do and enjoy the show. Thank you very much. Thank you.